We've seen massive investment in charging infrastructure over the past few years. Across the world, we've seen charging networks expanding at an unprecedented rate to meet the growing demand from ever-increasing numbers of EV drivers. As EVs are adopted by a wider range of people, those EV networks are going to be more and more important to the future of our transportation system. Unless, of course, we start investing massively in public transport. And we've started to see EV drivers reliant on those networks because they like charging at home or at work. Thanks to that hockey stick growth in ownership that we've seen over the past few years and the increasing importance of the networks as infrastructure. After years of struggling financially, EV charging networks are starting to be viewed as a source of income and have increasingly been bought up as companies look to a zero emissions future. So that's all good, right? Yeah, maybe not so much. Let's dig in. Anyone who's followed this channel, or EV news in general for a while, will know that for a long time there were a vast number of EV charging networks. Back when I lived in the UK, I used to have a literal wallet just filled with charge cards from different companies and would look up the regions I was taking my tiny little iMeve to and sign up for charging networks in advance because, and this truly ridiculous situation does still exist in some places, although thankfully much less so, sometimes you needed to sign up ahead of time and get a physical card through the mail to initiate charging. At worst these days it's usually to download an app and mostly these days you can initiate charging with a credit or debit card anyhow. It's just cheaper if you're a member. But over the past few years we've seen those networks slowly being acquired and reacquired and reacquired to become mostly one of a few large chains of EV charging networks. In the US, among the big hitters, we have Electrify America, EVgo, Tesla, although obviously Tesla has not been acquiring other networks, and ChargePoint, to name but a few. In Europe, there's Ionity, Osprey, Fastned, Instavolton. Well, I could go on, but I won't. Just this once, as a treat. Now, one of the huge benefits of this has been the gradual incorporation of all the disparate networks into something much more manageable for the typical EV driver. Rather than 20 apps, you might only have a few, or only one. Your car might just be configured so you can plug it in and charge without doing anything at all, at least at the networks you typically use. That's partly been a result of the networks becoming larger and rolling in those smaller indie networks, and that's partly because we've finally got roaming agreements between different charging providers so that your authentication for one network may well work at another. So it's not like the gradual monopolization of charging networks hasn't been without any benefits. And as they've been acquired, we've seen promises of incredible investment into expansion tied in with, across Europe and the US, infrastructure investment from various governments. And since we've also seen some of the older networks, well, basically disappear. For example, Blink in the US, while it's still around, has left a veritable cornucopia of sick or dead charging stations, which may or may not still connect to its network, may or may not work even if they do manage to connect, and may in some places just be cluttering up parking spaces with very dead hardware. So investment in the charging networks is definitely a positive. And so far this all looks like a nice rosy picture, yes? Only not so much, because the companies behind these investments and the acquisitions are mostly oil companies. And oil companies, having realised that they're getting some traction with their fear, uncertainty and doubt, are starting to think that Maybe, just maybe, they can ease off the throttle and in some cases just abandon the networks they've bought. And look, let's be clear, even oil companies know that their time producing energy from fossil fuels is limited. Demand for electric vehicles is expected to continue to rise and Morgan Stanley estimates that 1 to 3 million public charging station points could be needed in Western Europe alone by 2030. 
The National Renewable Energy Laboratory says that the US will need at least 2.1 million public charging points by 2030, and Shell's own estimates suggest that a quarter of the world's car fleet will be electric by 2040. So it's not surprising that, say, any one of the super major oil companies bought Italy's largest charging network, B Power, back in 2021. Or that Total Energies bought Spanish network Nordian CPO. Or that BP bought Chargemaster and Amplipower. Or that Shell bought Greenlots and New Motion and Ubitricity. And apparently Volta for cents on the dollar. Oil companies are growing increasingly aware of the potential threat to their downstream business from the electrification of transport, and they're keen to make up some of that lost revenue using EV infrastructure. So over the past few years, as governments have appeared to be pedal tepidly in the vague direction of the metal on the EV transition, with phase-outs announced for the sale of new fossil fuel passenger vehicles and increasing incentives for heavy goods vehicles to transition to electric, we have actually seen some significant investments in the build-out of charging infrastructure from the oil companies that now own these networks. For example, BP last year purchased $100 million worth of Tesla chargers for installation beginning this year in the US. The company states that it plans to expand the BP Pulse network, including at Key, BP, Amoco, AMPM, and Thornton's branded sites, among others. It's part of their commitment to invest, quote, up to $100 billion in EV charging by 2030. Although, I will note that the up to in that sentence means that they've already met that promise by spending a hundred million. Up to is really a very handy word for companies. Always look both at what they say and what they don't, and what they actually do and what they don't, eh? And Shell, it's not only bought up a company who used advertising dollars to help fund free charging sessions for local communities, communities that would not traditionally be serviced by rival infrastructure companies. And instead of going, hmm, this is a good business model, we should keep it going, they seem to instead have gone, but why aren't people paying for charging? They should be paying. At least that's what the multiple reports we've heard from people who've encountered engineers working on their network suggest, that the free ad-supported charging stations are slowly going to become paid charging stations instead, and Shell will likely pocket the ad dollars for extra money from those stations. In those areas where free charging had not only made it easier for folks without dedicated charging at home to own an EV, but actually helped some people transition and be able to afford an EV, this could be catastrophic. This is, to be clear, still a rumour, but when we wrote to them more than a month ago to confirm the multiple reports we'd heard, we got nothing but crickets. Which is a big change from the Volta that invited us to come tour their facility and which excitedly took part in our charging equity video. And look, I'm sure many of you, like me, are wondering if this is another example of big oil trying to buy up then kill cleaner transport. Like Chevron buying the battery patents for the batteries used in EVs in the early thousands and then stopping people building EVs with them. Or like GM and others' purchases of streetcars, which are the subject of many a conspiracy and even the odd film or two. Hey mister, ain't you got a car? Who needs a car in LA? We got the best public transportation system in the world. Just to be clear, while car and oil companies' purchases of public transportation did undoubtedly hasten their demise, especially with the decision to rip out electric trams and replace them with buses with no dedicated bus lanes, there were other decisions that also didn't help. Like tram companies having contracted to keep fixed low prices, or having agreed to maintain the surrounding road surfaces for all of their lines, 
and of course the fact that federal fuel taxes only went to roads and not to public transportation until the mid 50s. All of that contributed, but car companies buying and hobbling tram systems certainly didn't help. And actually, to an extent, that's probably a better mirror for where we are now. Because as of this year, now that oil companies own vast swathes of charging infrastructure, we're seeing governments giving in to pressure from the oil majors. Pressure from legacy automobile companies and pressure from the right wing of many countries' political parties, all of which have enormous amounts of money to make by keeping the status quo the uh, status quo. Although it is important to note that a recent report from Zero Emission Scotland indicates that as of 2031, it will cost more energy to extract fossil fuels from the North Sea than we will gain by using them. So North Sea oil will be a net negative energy source. Using a thermodynamic model of oil production, which accounts for inefficiencies and factors in energy costs, global oil extraction will be a net negative for energy production by the end of the 2030s. Alaska's oil is already net negative, which hasn't actually stopped us burning it yet. Yay! Fossil fuel subsidies are amazing! And that future theoretical money has led to vast amounts of lobbying to try and force countries to abandon or weaken promises to cut carbon emissions, particularly transportation carbon emissions. The irony here is that EVs are the compromise. They're a step in a long path. If we were really committed to limiting climate change as much as we really should be, We'd need huge cuts to extraction. We'd need really substantial changes to our modern way of life, the design of our cities, our levels of consumption. We'd need epic investments in renewable power and basically to transition to an all public transit all the time system for mobility in most places with cars being restricted to rural areas and those with mobility needs that can't be met through public transit. We've compromised and said, hey, let's do EVs. It buys us some time. And as is so often the case with the right... No, Kate, no, don't say it! Don't say what? Don't say right... Um, things that birds have. Beaks? Don't play clever with me, young lady. I know your mother. A lovely lady, actually. I, I just I think we should use a less... politically charged term. Like neo-national? No, no, no. I think, perhaps, uh, those who, oh no, um, people who worship at the altar of profit regardless of the social, economic, environmental, or planetary consequences. H how about that? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Those snowflakes. Sorry, where was I? Oh yes, those people. Give them an inch and they'll take decades from human life on the planet. Oil companies and car companies can smell blood in the water. They know if they keep pushing, keep spreading FUD, keep supporting political candidates and parties who want to delay our transition to cleaner energy, they can make a few extra quid in the meantime and damn the consequences for the rest of us. And that means that they've dropped investments in EV infrastructure. BP is pulling out of two-thirds of the worldwide markets it had invested in, and it's unclear what will happen to the infrastructure that it bought. Will it end up like those dead blink chargers that dot the US? Who knows? BP certainly aren't saying much. But seeding doubt about the reliability and durability of the charging network is undoubtedly a side benefit for BP of its decision to concentrate on markets it thinks will be profitable more quickly. Now, to be fair, Shell has said that in the US it's going to close around 7% of its Shell-owned gas stations across the US over the next two years. That's around 1,000 of the 13,000 stations. It said that it wants to focus on EV charging, but as we say back home, the proof's in the pudding. And while they might not like to admit it, the oil majors are close to having a near monopoly on charging, at least outside of Tesla. And while they'll profess that everything that they're doing is with the consumer at heart, 
there's literally no examples of monopolies actually improving things for consumers. So keep a close eye on these companies. Keep watching what they're doing, not just what they're saying. Keep pressuring both them and your representatives, both at the local and the national level. Join local groups that push for a more equitable future for transportation and the environment. And most of all, make sure that no one gets the opportunity to slow our transition to a cleaner future. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Justin Fermenich, Randy Bayer, Zoe Warwick, Mark Desmura, World's Tallest Hobbit, and Kenneth. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. Address is also down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below too. This month, we're celebrating spring with an amazing t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. It's all about growing your own EV charging with solar power. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you've subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!